continuation of our scripture reading for this morning is still from John 12, uh, verses 14 through 16. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now among these who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was the Bethesda in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Good morning. Let us pray. May our eyes be open to see God on a donkey. May our hearts be ready to be challenged by the prophetic celebration of Palm Sunday. And may we be transformed and challenged in wonderful and difficult ways as we enter Holy Week. Amen. So today, is about a parade, well, several parades. The first parade that I have a memory of as a child living in Southern California, can you guess what it might be? The Rose Parade, right, the Rose Parade. Um, I've been to the Rose Parade any number of times. I've gone there and spent all night, which I don't recommend. <laughs> that was terrible. And I spent all night there with like college friends and when we were in high school, we did it. And, and there were no Starbucks on Colorado Boulevard then. You had your thermos of coffee and you were happy with it. No lattes. I've also been lived as an adult close enough to Colorado Boulevard to walk down early in the morning and just kind of see it with friends, which really is one of the better ways to do it. And then I also in high school had a friend whose father was a lawyer and his law office was right in front of the Norton Simon Museum, which is right on that turn there if you know where it is. And um, so his law firm used to host a um, breakfast, catered, and then they would lay out seats right down there. And that is the best way to see it. <laughs> the best way to see it. After that, I really couldn't go back. I really couldn't go back. <laughs> in fact, I always whine and moan when I'm not in Southern California on New Year's, because I don't know if you know this or not, but not everywhere around the country watches the Rose Parade. Right? In fact, you can be somewhere else and you wake up in the morning and you turn on Channel 5, there's no Rose Parade. There's no Rose Parade. And I am a Rose Parade snob because I believe that the only people that should commentate on the Rose Parade are Stephanie Edwards and Bob Eubanks. Am I right? Right? That's, that's what I think. But I wonder if you've ever thought about what we're celebrating when we celebrate the Rose Parade. Because normally parades are about celebration. And of course, um, the celebration began when I looked up the history of it as a celebration of New Year's, right? Wonderful. But what, a, what are the roses for? Does anyone know like what the roses are for? Well, the history seems to indicate that the roses are a neener, neener, neener to the rest of the country. <laughs> so it's New Year's and it's snowing where you are? <laughs> Where we are, roses are in bloom. <laughs> we live in a gorgeous place. Come move to Southern California. And it kind of has worked, huh? It's kind of worked. Maybe that's why not every station carries it, now that we think about it. Right? 
But it's wonderful, and I have that wonderful memory. And while everybody loves a good parade, um, there are two other parades that are more important that we focus on today. Two, you say, right? Say it. Two, you say? Yes, two. Because you know who else loved a good parade? Roman rulers. Roman rulers loved a good parade. More specifically, Pontius Pilate loved a good parade. So I call Parade One the Parade of Roses and Thorns. You may be surprised to learn that Pontius Pilate, even though he was the governor over Judea and Palestine, where Jerusalem was, did not live in Jerusalem. He lived in the governor's residence in Caesarea, which was a port city northwest of Jerusalem on the Mediterranean coast of Palestine. Caesarea was a decadent tourist haven with modern Roman architecture and all the advantages a Roman citizen could ever want. And so only during important Jewish festivals, like Passover, did Pilate leave his fancy digs and make his way down to little old Jerusalem. He always took an army, and Pilate's army came for a show. They came to show, to ensure stability, and to let the Jews know who was really in charge. Pilate's parade was a grand sight, fit for a king. Mighty steeds, weapons of war, cloaks of the finest material, power and physical majesty. There were probably as fine a parade as any rose parade float. It looked very majestic. Passover was a particularly volatile time because it was the week of celebration of the Jewish liberation from the empire of Egypt. You could see how that might make Rome worry, right? So Pilate wanted to remind the Jews who were under Roman occupation that their God was not going to save them from this occupation. The imperial power that was displayed in the parade was all a public statement about who was in charge. Now, of course, Pilate did not see himself as an oppressor. Oppressors rarely do. But he saw himself as an ambassador for peace, for the Pax Romana. Whether people wanted it or not, this Roman peace brought about the advantages of civilization. Beautiful buildings, roads, trade, and prosperity, peace by military conquest, peace through subjugation and coercion, rule by fear and occupation. Peace that worked really well for a very few people who got it. Not the slaves or the workers or the day laborers. Did you ever wonder why Jesus tells so many stories and parables about workers in the fields and in farming? Well, let's just say the occupied Israel was not a very good place to make a living unless you were upper class, unless you were a Roman citizen. If you wanted any rights at all, this was not the place to be. They lived mostly under the thorns of oppression. And then we have the second parade, the one you're probably more familiar with. I call it the Jesus Donkey Parade. What else could you call it? I mean, only in John does it describe palms, but Mark and I had a discussion that in other of the Gospels it talks about they threw their cloaks down, their, their coats down, or other branches, and we kind of think cloak Sunday would be weird, right? So we'll keep it Palm Sunday. Is that good? Okay. First note. Um, all of the Gospels have this detail, have Jesus riding in the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. And when all four Gospels have something, it's probably important to take note. This was a powerful symbol that every religious Jew would have understood as the fulfillment of the messianic, messianic voice of Zechariah the prophet. According to the prophet, the Messiah would come on the humble back of a donkey. And the shouts of Hosanna were from those who expected Jesus to act like an earthly king and drive out Rome and restore Jewish power. Hosanna, after all, means rescue me, save me. This was a prophetic parade. Two different parades, two different kinds of leaders displaying two different stories about power and salvation. And it's within this story, this small story of power, that Jesus wants to break free. We see this small story of power over and over again in the Hebrew scriptures, our Old Testament. And those who have come to the Judges Interfaith Study, if you haven't, you've missed out, because it's been amazing to learn from the rabbi and the cantor all about the book of Judges in the Old Testament. But we see in the book of Judges, so a few of you are with me, is Pat here? 
right? Do we have, is Jim here? Okay. So we have this cycle, right? We have this cycle in Judges that's actually the larger cycle of the Old Testament, but it's a cycle of people do wicked things, they are put under oppression by an enemy, they cry out to God for justice and salvation, God sends a judge, in that case in the book of Judges, to rescue them from that specific situation, and then they're rescued, and then a short time of peace is had. And what happens is, that sounds lovely, right? Except the cycle happens over and over and over again. It's almost endless. And we see that cycle in our world today. There's a similar cycle in history. It is slavery and occupation, people crying out for injustice, rising up against their oppressor with righteous indignation, a violent and vindictive overthrow of oppressors, then bolstered by your own power, you become oftentimes the oppressor to others or do what's wicked in the eyes of God. And then the cycle starts over and over again. Because the same people that were saved out of Egypt that we celebrate on Passover, hundreds of years later, not that much longer, not that many generations later, become the oppressors themselves when King Solomon has slaves. So to go from being a slave to owning slaves is not that difficult. In fact, it's part of that cycle. This is the small story of salvation, the small story that the Israelites would have known very well, that the Jews of Jesus' day would have understood. And this is why Jesus is a threat to Roman rule, because those who get their power only from this kind of cycle always fear the uprising, because it's only fun to be the oppressor, isn't it? You never want to be on the other side of the cycle. And rather than Jesus being just a cog in that disastrous but seemingly inevitable cycle of rulers and political and, and war, or save people from the confines of their small story, save me or save us from, they would have said Rome, what would we say? What are our small stories? Save us from this. Fill in the blank. Instead, Jesus' life and ministry and death and resurrection was done to expose the lie of that kind of power. Of the, of the kind of power that Pilate's empire was based. Jesus was dismantling the power of this empire without any violence at all. But that dismantlement won't happen until Easter. So what do we have today? We have a kind of prophetic celebration. Note that even in the scripture, it talks about how the disciples did not know what was happening until later. Did you catch that? They sort of like, we, we were there. We saw the palms and the donkey thing, but it wasn't until much later that we understood what was going on. Because they were mired in their small story. Their small story was, God, rescue us from Roman occupation. But God in Christ was in the middle of a much bigger story, which is so often why whenever the disciples said something, Jesus went, ugh, you're in the wrong story. I'm in a bigger story. A story that the prophets tried to tell for hundreds of years in the Old Testament. That God desires mercy, not sacrifice. Love, not vindictive anger. Peace, not a sword. And with the extended reading, I wanted us all to be aware that even in that time, Jesus was opening up that story to even Greeks were coming. People were coming from all over to see Jesus. And he understood that it may not end well because it never ends well for people like Jesus. And he wanted to make a statement about what he desired from them. He said, I don't want to revenge. I don't want your violence to come from the violence that will be done to me. I don't want you here to get your own kind of power. Don't come here because I'm popular or because I did miracles. Don't come here to get something out of this. But be here because you're going to carry on the work that I started. You're going to be my fruit. They were to carry on the mission of love and mercy. Today is Palm Sunday. And it isn't just about triumph, not yet. It is not just another excuse for a parade, and it's not a gloating neener neener to the rest of the world. It's about donkeys. It's about the how of getting power. It's about the way we are to be in this world, which is like Jesus. Today is a time to stop as a Christian community and reflect on who God is through the identity of this crazy guy named Jesus. It is also a time to be wretched out of our own small stories, not because our small stories don't matter 
but because God doesn't want you to miss the big story of salvation. Salvation now won't come as a conquering army. It will come in riding on a silly little donkey. This donkey holding a god is leading a prophetic celebration of enormous proportions. And this donkey and this Jesus tell us what God is like. Many of us still see God as far off, or worse yet, up in heaven, looking down at us with a scolding or judgment, always like a wagging finger, right? Or a judge with a gavel, and it, your sentence has been passed. Or as the leader of a brutal army. We see God in a variety of different ways. But the thing is that God isn't standing far off. Today, God is riding on a donkey in the center of town. And where will God be on Thursday? Not in the comfort of a heavenly throne or in a fancy kingly mansion filled with servants, but he'll be eating a simple Passover meal with his friends and he'll be washing their feet. Where will he be on Friday? God isn't wielding the hammer of war on Friday to get justice for himself and his followers. God will be hanging from a cross on Friday. And on Sunday, God isn't angry or vindictive. He is risen. When we celebrate Palm Sunday, we do so knowing that this is the lens with which we will look upon all of the activities of Holy Week leading up to Easter. We meet a God not of stuff other than earth, somewhere lofty and off, but of flesh who proclaims by every action that Jesus takes, I would rather die than being in this sin accounting business anymore. I would rather die than, than look at your blood sacrifices anymore. I would rather die than be a player in this cycle of violence and vengeance and oppression. And this was so strange that 2,000 years ago it happened and people haven't forgotten about it since. So as we move towards Easter, I want you to remember that you do not go there alone. That is the message of Palm Sunday. That you are the part, a player in the bigger story of God and of salvation. You are a part of that. You are the fruit of Jesus' labor. You are who God cares so deeply about that he wanted to cut off that cycle that's endless and never ending. Stop that cycle and say the power of love breaks all of the power that you see around you. Jesus enters in with you this week, riding a donkey beside you, before you. He does this to remind you that there is no place you can go, that there's nothing that you can do where the relentless and powerful love of God will not pursue after you. Because God is love. And the power of love is what you have, and the power of love breaks down any other power, and the power of love is the fruit of all that has come before you. Hosanna in the highest, indeed. Welcome to Holy Week.